there are so many exciting things about reverse engineering, but one of the things in particular that got me into reverse engineering was malicious software, specifically sitting at my hole at Packard when I was a child, dialing into bullet board systems and downloading as much information as I could, reading things like 40 hex and reading articles about how viruses were written and how antivirus systems work. Fast forward many years later, and I come across the book, The Art of Computer Virus Research and Defense by Peter Zor. And even notice this, the uh, quote on the front is by uh, Halver Flake. So uh, didn't even know who that was at the time, but this kind of struck an, a chord with me that there were so many interesting components to reverse engineering at the time. And I really only thought that reverse engineering was about reverse engineering malware. It was really any reason to reverse engineer other types of software. And at the time, it didn't really seem like that was the case. But one of the things that I kind of noticed when I was scanning over this again was this kind of anecdote that was brought forward by Peter Zor. And that says, my own interest in computer viruses began in September 1990 when my new PC clone displayed a bizarre message followed by two beeps. The message read, your PC is now stoned. And if that sets the stage for everything that viruses were really at the time, nowadays viruses are really about, you know, ransomware or botnets and, you know, financial gain. But at the time, reverse engineering mount malicious software and development of viruses was sort of like graffiti in the sense that you created art and you wanted to display it somewhere. And it was this sense of like vandalism, but it was beautiful at the same time. There's really fascinating anecdotes and stories about that kind of stuff in here. The landscape for viruses has really changed over the years, but the things that are really kind of fascinating about it kind of remain. There's still this kind of cops versus robbers or cats and mice or um, what is it? Uh, the one guys versus the other thing, whatever it is. The idea is that there's a lot of really fun, fascinating aspects to your reverse engineering. And one of those is anti-debugging. Now the organization page for Hackovert on GitHub has a link to a bunch of different repos. And one of those repos is anti-debug, which features a bunch of Windows anti-debugging techniques in both x86 and x64. These are specifically for Windows and they feature different types of checks like memory, CPU, timing, and force exceptions. And it's all built with Visual Studio 2019. Um, and what we're going to do in this video is take a look at the very first basic concepts of that. We're going to sort of lay the groundwork for all of the different components or different types of uh, anti-reverse engineering methods that we'll look at in this series. The first ones are going to be, uh, is debugger present? It's not a very sexy uh, anti-debugging trick, uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to see how that looks in multiple debuggers, and we're going to take a look under the hood and how that actually checks that by checking a field in the process environment block. From there, in future videos, we're going to take a look at more complex cases, and we'll see how they require specific instances to happen. So in some of them, you might need to pass the exception to the debugger to handle. In others, you might have to step over something. In other cases, you might need to run past it real fast in order to avoid the check. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about what you can do and why you would employ these types of checks um, and try to give some stories about anti-reverse or anti-debugging tricks that we've seen uh, while reverse engineering malicious software uh, and just kind of have a good time with anti-debugging tricks. So one of the things that we're going to do is take a look at this particular repo. This repo is again a Visual Studio 2019 repo and what we're going to do is crack open this uh, gauntlet CPP. In here, we have a main function. All of this is actually just C. And we have every single check laid out in order. And the idea is to load this into a bugger and start stepping your way through, bypassing every single check, trying to get down to the end, where it displays the message, congratulations, you made it, you win. Now, what we're gonna do is comment out all of these, and we're just gonna focus on a couple of these cases because we want to sort of highlight each individual case and how it's unique and different and how it's sort of manifestation or what it looks like in X64 and X86, uh, and especially in different debuggers. So we're gonna go ahead and do that. The very first thing that we're gonna do is take a peek inside of anti-debugging. Inside of anti-debugging is where everything is laid out for us. We have sort of this little debug message helper that will pop up. That is, of course, if you keep um, this show debug messages defined. So by default, this is actually defined. So whenever you get caught, 
this will pop up and tell you which caught, which anti-debugging technique actually caught you. Um, so some of the weird things that we have to do here is that Visual Studio allows you to inline assembly for x86. So if we come up here and we select our x86 build and go ahead and build this guy, there is no problem with doing this. If I were to target x64 and do this, it's going to complain. The weird thing with x64 is that we actually have to keep everything off in its own assembly file and just call from it. The way that we do that is we have this anti-debug ASM, which lays out all of our methods that we have implemented to x86-64, x86 which requires uh, inline assembly. In here, we're actually going to jump to these routines and use them. In certain cases, we're going to return. In other cases, we won't need to. Um, so for any of these particular checks that require inline assembly, for example, uh, this being debugged PEB check, uh, which checks the process environment block, we're going to need to implement that separately into another file. Um, we're going to go through that and show how that kind of works. So again, let's go ahead and come back here. We'll take is debugger present and we'll use this as our very first check. The rest of the stuff I'm going to go ahead and comment out because we won't need it right now. Now I'll go ahead and build the solution for XCC4 and then I'll switch over to x86 and we'll build that too. Now that both of these are built, we're going to go ahead and open it up a debugger and see what happens. All right. So if I go into the x86 build, the 32-bit build, and just run it, it's going to tell us, congratulations, you've made it. It's because there's no actual debugger, so nothing got detected. I'll go ahead and throw this into x64 debug, and x64 debug the 32-bit version, x32 debug, uh, since this is a 32-bit executable, and we'll just run it. Now it says caught by is debugger present. The reason why it was caught is because that particular Windows API call was called, and we didn't patch it out. So I'll just hit F9 step forward a little bit with F8, and then I'll scan down looking for the main function. Um, there it is. Press F2 to set a breakpoint, F9 to run, F7 to step in. And then what we have here is a call to is debugger present. Now is debugger present is a just standard M like Windows 32 system call. So I'll do MSDN and look for is debugger present. This is sort of like the hello world of all anti-debugging techniques, right? So is debugger to present determines whether the calling process is being debugged by a user mode debugger. So now we'll go ahead and step into this and we'll notice that there's a jump over here. Follow that. It's using the FS segment register and then taking 30 hex from that, putting it into EAX and then using two offset from that to copy that byte over. What that is, is referencing the process environment block. Uh, 30 offset from the FS register is going to be a reference to the PEB. Two off into that PEB is going to be where the being debug flag is. We're going to take that and then once we return, now we have EAX is one. And right here is where we're actually going to do our test. And if that's the case, we're going to go ahead and fire off our you uh, got caught, okay? So the easy way to uh, just kind of patch this, of course, is to just step into here. We can knock out this call, but if we wanted to just do it, we can step over this, decrement this, and then as we run, congratulations, you made it. Nothing too interesting there. We're gonna go ahead and do the same thing, and I'm gonna do it in win debug. Oops, my computer works with me. I'm gonna go ahead and open up uh, win debug. So file launch executable, uh, this is in release here. And then we'll go ahead and fire this off. Caught by is debugger present. So that's exactly what we expected to see. I'll go ahead and restart this. Um, inside of here, sometimes what we'll try to do is put little bits of helpful information. So for example, want to inspect the PEB structure, you can launch the gauntlet, which is this binary that we're looking at right now, uh, in WinDebug and take a look at the PEB. We can run this command to do that. Go back here, right here. And then if we scroll all the way up to the start of the structure, uh, we're going to see the very first, second, and then third. So two offset is going to be being debugged. And that's what we're actually checking for under the hood. So there are sort of like two ways that we end up doing this, right? One is by using the actual Win32 API call, is debugger present, which will go ahead and fire off this the central thing, right? Um, another one that we have is we'll actually use uh, the actual PEB check ourselves. So we go down here. I can copy this guy out. 
load this. And what this will do, instead of making that system call, it's going to do exactly what that system call did. So when we were taking a look and we saw that 30 offset with a 30 hex reference from the FS segment register being referenced and then two off from that to check the being debug flag, this is what we're going to do. So if you knew is debugger present is a trick to be able to tell whether or not a debugger is actually being used. Um, but you didn't know how that worked, you might be fooled into actually just kind of skipping over that particular part and being caught. Now the question is, what happens when an anti-debugging trick catches you, right? You might think that, oh, okay, well, anti-debugging tricks are used so that they can just detach the debugger right away, right? When in reality, there are some really kind of nasty things that we can do. If you've ever reverse engineered large complex software, you realize that there's just too much to analyze. We have to focus on small bits and pieces of it of functionality. We may want to know where does this thing call out to when it starts up, how often, like what's the delay timer on it before it actually fires off and does anything? Um, does it try to uh, collect any files from the disk? Is it um, you know, downloading any like second or third stage payloads to this? Like, There's lots of different things that we would want to know. Um, and in this particular case, what it could do is if it detects that there's a debugger present, it could send us off into dummy code that does nothing, but it's really complex, causing us to analyze things that we just don't need to, and they don't do anything, right? So this could be like leading us down the path of chasing red herrings at worst. Um, it could do lots of really funny, weird things to us. There's just so many, so many weird things that you could potentially do rather than just detaching the debugger. Because to me, as a reverse engineer, if I'm stepping over functions and then I step over function A and that disconnect or detaches the debugger, I know I'm just going to set a breakpoint on that function and then step into it and keep working my way until I, until I get detached from the debugger. And at that point, I know that I'm looking at some type of anti-debugging technique, right? Whereas if you're a little bit more sneaky and you cause sort of like pain to the reverse engineer uh, from these methods, then that's a problem, right? So the ability to find these types of issues and work past them is really important. And you won't always see them occurring right away. And it won't always be obvious that you've been caught by an anti-debugging technique, right? So let's go ahead, before I recompile this, to use the second method, which is being debug peb. We're going to go ahead and take a look at the 64-bit version. Okay, so I'll come back here, and I've already compiled this. I will throw a release into x64 debug. And we're going to do the same exact thing we did on 32, but you're going to notice that the, the method that when we drill into is debugger present is going to look different on 64-bit. Okay, so I'll run, step a little bit, and then take a look at anti-debugging. I already had this set up, done this before. Um, and then I'll step a little bit into here, jump. And now all of a sudden it's the GS segment register and it's a 60 hex offset. And it's still from that PEB reference, still the two offset, right? So the PEB structure remains, at least at the beginning, the same, right? So the, the process of whether or not we're running a 32-bit or a 64-bit uh, uh, binary or application is going to look different in the way that we reference the start of the PEP. Okay, so this is essentially what we want to do in our next anti debugging check, which is not making that call to the actual uh, is debugger present function itself. What we want to do is mimic exactly what happens in here. And the way that we end up doing that, I'll go ahead and close this and show you is to essentially just inline for x86, at least this information. So we clear EAX just to get it nice and clean <laughs> to zero it out. And then what we'll do is we'll reference the start of the PEB, uh, put that into EAX, and then from EAX, we're gonna go too often to that for the uh, is being debugged, and then we'll mask off just the lower byte of that and then we're going to set EAX into this found local variable. You can do this in, in line to semi in, in Visual Studio. It's really nice. So at this particular point, we put the return value of the, or whatever EAX is into found. And then we check to see if found is true. And if it is, then we mark you're caught by this particular case, right? It's a little bit different for x86 or 64 since we can't inline it in Visual Studio. So we'll go over here and we'll take a look at that check. And that check is this. And again, it's essentially the same thing, except we're using 
GS60 instead of FS30, okay? So just something important to note. And we can go ahead and take a look at that. I'm going to just rebuild real fast. So I'm going to build solution. This is 32. I'll switch over to 64. Once those two are done, we'll go ahead and take our 64-bit version and throw it in here. Run, step, 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 step. Take a look down here. It's still there, which is really cool. Um, step into this, and then there it is, right? So this is our 64-bit version that we saw in the ASM file, and it's right here, right? So this is really cool. Like if we looked at all of our import functions, if we looked at, um, you know, for for this is debugger present call, we wouldn't see it at all, right? This is a great way to kind of do this. We can do other methods like dynamically importing um, that Win32 API call, so we don't see it on the imports, and then just call it later but this is sort of a little bit more elegant method to be able to do it. And if we were to debug the 32-bit version, we'd see exactly the same thing, except the FS30 hex reference, right? So those are the first two methods for anti-debugging. Um, again, they're not the most creative or interesting things, but they can burn you if you're not paying attention to it, um, and you can get caught. So hopefully that was interesting. We're going to continue this series by taking a look at other methods. And what we'll do is see that not all of these methods are effective in every debugger. For this particular series, we'll be looking at x64 debug, uh, Ollie debug, maybe immunity debugger, um, and win debug because they're all free and available. Using something like Ida Pro to debug would be fantastic, but it costs money. And I want to make sure that this is accessible to as many people as possible that may not have the resources to purchase expensive professional software. So until next time, happy debugging. Oh my gosh, so stupid. I wasn't even showing my screen, was I? Yes, I was. What you think, what you think about When you're born into a fight Let them burn